Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. I'll get right into it. First, um, if you go to the book of Romans, chapter number 11. The reason why I wanted to teach this is because of some things that I've been hearing with my own ears that have offended me. And there are not many things that do, but this one in particular I think is offensive enough that I'm willing to put folks out to church for it so it don't spread up in here. Amen. Y'all know me. I've been here for how long? Seven years. Seven years. I don't get rough with folks, but this will make me get rough. There's some things that just ruffle my feathers, and I can't take it. Amen. You'll see what I'm talking about here in a minute. In the book of Romans, chapter 11, and verse number 19. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Now, according to this scripture, we are unnatural in this. We were not originally a part of the olive tree, but God saw fit to have mercy on us, to make a way for us, and to graft us in. And it is important for us to understand the fact then that it was an unnatural thing that got us in here in the first place, right? How many in here are Jewish by birth? Can trace your lineage. And every single one of us in here, let me make sure, any hands? Then every single one of us is a wild olive branch. God did not break all of them off. But some of them remained, and we were grafted in among them, weren't we? Amen. Salvation is not to the Gentile only. Salvation is to the Jew and the Gentile. But who first? To the Jew first, then to us. The reason why we come second is because we were the wild olive branch. We were grafted in. So everything that we get is based on what root system we are tied into. And we are tied into the root of Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate source of all that we have. All that we are. And as a result of that, we, if we are his children, we behave like him because that's where we are drawing our strength from, our food from, from the Lord. Let me change gears. The United States is one of those countries that is called the Great Melting Pot. We have people that come into this country from all over the world, different religions, different ethnicities, different walks of life. And let me tell you a problem that is more prevalent than we see because of the way the media portrays it. There is a problem when you leave your country 
because of the persecution that's going on there or because of the poverty that's going on there. Then you come to this country and you want to drag your old ways from your country here. That's why your country wasn't working. It wasn't working because of the way they were doing things. So then you want to drag all that mess over to this country. Is this making sense? It does no good when you live in a country that's based on classism that determines things based on what status you are and you flee from there and come here and try to start a caste system here. That was the original foundation, one of the foundational points this country was built on that no matter where you, can, where you come from, you can come to this country and experience freedom. But that's not the way it worked from the very beginning. That's why we have little Italy and Chinatown, the French Quarter. That's why we have a Mexican section of town and we have a black side of town because people have a habit of following their nationality, their language, their culture, and grouping together in groups and trying to make that work. Isn't that what God did in the very beginning, why he came to the Tower of Babel? What was his command to mankind? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now that's what God told man to do. Go to the book of Genesis, chapter number 11, I think. And verse number 4, and they said, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. What are they doing? The opposite of what God said do. Replenish the earth. And they said, let's build a tower so God won't flood us out. And we don't have to scatter where God told us to scatter. We can just stay right where we are. It is, if I can say it this way, it is built into us to go near people that are like us. I've been in other countries before. I was in a country one time and nobody there spoke the language. And I came across someone that spoke English. And you know my first thing was, hey, where are you from? California? No kidding, I'm from Indiana. Now we're having a conversation, you know why? Because we alike. We're from the same culture. We're from the same country. So we identified very readily with each other. Do you think for a second that if I saw somebody from California down at the mall, I would stop and, hey, man, where are you from? Never. I wouldn't do that. But one of the things, One of the things that we have done from the very beginning in this country is go against the very thing that we said was the foundation of this country. I was listening to National Public Radio not too long ago and they was interviewing a man that was in his late 70s who did not speak English, he was Korean. At the end of the interview, the, the gentleman that was doing the interview said, just so that the audience knows this man has never spoke English and yet he was born in San Francisco and raised in the United States, has never been anywhere else other than California, and yet does not speak one word of English. He's in his 80s, or in his late 70s. The reason why is because they all congregated, the Koreans all congregated together, and there was no need for him to learn a different language. Everything that he needed was being brought to him. We do make an attempt as a country. 
we do make an attempt to stop this type of behavior. We have made amendments to our Constitution to try and ensure that all men truly are created equal. We have passed laws to make sure that people in this country have free access to everything that everyone has free access to. We have allowed or have taken it as far as the highest courts in this country so that the Supreme Court would uphold the rulings of the lower courts in the states to ensure that everyone had equal access to anything. And with all of that, it still fails. Do you know why? Do you know why people have died trying to get access to freedom? Do you know why people have sacrificed their lives trying to gain access to things that they were told you have a right to, but someone said you can't have it? Do you know why? Because without the Holy Ghost, people will always follow human nature. Human nature says, I'm better than you. Human nature says, I don't want to be around you. You're not of my financial class. You're a different color than I am. You don't speak English. That's what human nature says. The only solution to the problems that we are having in our culture is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's the only thing that's going to fix the problems that we have. My problem is the fact that sometimes, even after people get the Holy Ghost, they still cling to the old nature. Are y'all with me? People still want to cling on to their old hates, their old prejudices. But if you don't allow the Holy Ghost to change you, you'll never change. I had a young lady come to me one time and said, would you talk to my husband? He's doing this, this, and this. And maybe he'll listen to you. I said, he's got the Holy Ghost. If he don't listen to God, he sure won't listen to me. The Holy Ghost is the ultimate teacher. The Holy Ghost is the one that, that opens our eyes, that allows us to see what it is that God is expecting from his people. Well, the saints ain't saying amen, so she is. Go on, girl. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, in just the very first phrase. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 13. The first question. Is Christ divided? The obvious answer, no, he is not. Christ is not divided at all. Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond, nor free. But Christ is all and in all. When he starts off by, and there's more to it above that, lie not one to another. What's he referring to? He's referring to the old nature. That's what we did 
before we received the Holy Ghost, didn't we? Now, I know there are some people that say, um, I can deal with a thief, but I can't handle a liar. Everybody's a liar. Before you get the Holy Ghost, you might not have been the kind of person that would tell bold-faced lies, but everybody told lies. Amen. 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 Even babies, before they can talk, tell lies. Sure they do. Babies screaming and hollering. And you go pick them up and they just stop. You know what they're saying when they're screaming and hollering? Something's wrong! Something's wrong! And you pick them up. Thank you. They're lying. I used to take mine. And I don't think any of them's here tonight. I used to take mine. And I would feed them their bottle, change their diapers, make sure everything's okay. And then I'd lay them down and let them cry till they fell asleep. And I would just sit there and say, you'll get tired of crying before I get tired of listening. <laughs> now, they didn't know what I was saying. But crying is healthy for a baby. But one thing I knew, if I picked them up, and they had already eaten, and the diaper wasn't wet, they was lying. I'd lay them right back down. Amen. And you're going to deal with it. Yeah. That's the old nature. From the time, the Bible says we come forth from the womb telling lies. The Bible says that. We lie as babies. So he's talking about the nature of the unregenerated man. Lie not, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds or with his ways. We have put away the old ways. The flip side of that is that we have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that made us, that created us. We are now made in the image of God, aren't we? Amen. We are in the likeness of God. We should be like him, shouldn't we? Amen. Amen. He goes on and he gives us some categories here. And these are important. There is neither Greek nor Jew. That deals with nationality. There is no nationality in Christ. Circumcision or uncircumcision, that deals with religious customs. Because after the Holy Ghost was poured out, whether you were circumcised or not didn't matter. That was all a religious custom. We are no longer bound by religious customs. Amen. I've heard folks say things like this. Well, they used to be Catholic before they came here. I was, I've been apostolic my whole life. And I have a question about that. So what? What does that matter? What does it matter what you was before you got here? He goes on, neither barbarian. Now, in the Bible, the barbarian was the one that didn't believe in God. Okay. Ain't no barbarians in the church. Shouldn't be. And I'll tell you something, it shouldn't be either. Well, they're not as spiritual as I am. Shouldn't be that in the church. Well, I'm a, I, 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 I take my salvation a little more serious than they do. You are either going to get into heaven or you are not going to get into heaven. But there's not going to be a section of heaven for those that were more spiritual minded and more religious here than those that were just kind of, you know, just wishy-washy about their walk. You know, they, they, they wanted to get to heaven, but they really, you know, ain't going to be that in heaven. You either made it because you lived holy 
or you are not because you didn't obey what God has asked you to do. And everybody is not revealed the same amount of truth at the same time as everyone else. We're so busy trying to put folks in hell that we're going to miss heaven our own self. I don't understand why we got to keep bothering with folks. You're not that saved. All right, I'm going to leave that alone. He says, nor sent them. That was a group of people that were somewhat like, like barbarians in that they were not, not barbarians. They were nomadic people. But they also had a country, and they were also very good conquerors. They were culturally, they were very rich, and they were brilliant artists. But that don't matter in the church. It don't matter in the church if you're more talented than somebody else is. This is what Paul is telling us. That's why he selected these different people. Don't think that because you're a good artist that you're better than the other saints. Don't think that because you can sing till folks is crying and falling out on the floor, that makes you more saved than somebody else. Don't think that because you are a talented person and can build things that other people can't build, that that means you special in the eyes of God. It doesn't. He said that don't count when you get saved. Bond nor free. That's dealing with, if I can use modern day terminology, a business owner and an employee. When you get saved, you might be my boss at work, but when we come to church, we the same. We the children of God. Now, I worked for seven years for a man that had the Holy Ghost, and I never disrespected him one time. Anything he asked at work, I did it. He was never unfair in the things that he asked me to do, and I always went above and beyond for him the best I could. We're still friends today. When we went to church, he was a brother. We got to church, he didn't tell me, uh, go over there and pick up those papers in the edge of the parking lot and clean up a little, get, get a broom or something and sweep the patio off. He, he didn't do that. When we got to church, we were brothers. Now, let me be clear about where I'm coming from because I keep hearing it myself. I don't want somebody to think, who's been talking to the pastor? I'm hearing it. We are not going to have Greek nor Jew comments going on in this church. Let me be real clear. Black nor white nor Hispanic ain't happening here. That is the quickest way to get put out of this place that I can think of. We can deal with sin in the office but stir up some racial trouble in this church, and it's so long, fare thee well, bye-bye. You be gone so fast, folks will be asking, what happened to brother so-and-so? Oh, he's going to another church now. I'll help you find another church and let the pastor know there. The reason why he's no longer welcome here is because they keep on bringing up racial things in this church, and we don't tolerate that here. You know why? Because the scripture is against it. Bishop Paddock said that before he got in the PAW, he was among another group of brethren. And he left them because he did not like the fact that they made division among black and white. He didn't care for that. Now, I'm saying black and white, but let's just be honest. You look around here, there's some mixed up folks up in here. <laughs> Ain't too many people can claim a whole lot of nothing here. He said he left them because they were making division. Or as the Apostle Paul said about Peter, 
dissimulating among the brethren. So he left their group. But you know, Bishop Paddock was a very gifted teacher. And after a while, they wanted him back. And he said they came to him to try and woo him back. And here's the scripture that they used. In 1 Corinthians 11 and 14, it says, Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Now here was their reasoning. There are some things that nature teaches us that the Bible doesn't. Nature says we should separate ourselves. Isn't that what everybody does? Nature says let's segregate off by colors. Let's segregate off by language. That's what nature says. And he told them, he said, you brothers don't understand. That's the fallen nature. We have a new nature now. And in Christ, that old nature doesn't work anymore. The problem is, we want to drag it up in the church. And I'm going to explain why. That's why, I don't, just give me one song and a quick prayer, because I want some time to stretch out here a little bit and help us to understand what's wrong with what some of us are doing. In the book of Numbers, chapter number 12, I want you to see God's attitude about this. And not just in the church today. God's attitude has always been like this. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now, they're being clear about who this woman is, aren't they? Yeah. All right. Now, before folks jump off on the wrong foot and say, see, God was mad at him because she was an Ethiopian. That's an African. They, he was, they was mad at Moses because he married a black woman. That's not why they were mad. They was mad because she wasn't Jewish. Yes, sir. He said some Ethiopians are Jewish. That's true. But those Ethiopians became Jewish after the Holy Ghost was poured out. Remember the eunuch where uh, Philip came to him and said, understand this what thou readest? And he said, how can I accept some man guide me? And Peter opened the word to him. He was in Isaiah. He expounded that to him, baptized him, and the man received the Holy Ghost. He was an Ethiopian. And he carried that back to his country. So um, as far as Jewish people are concerned, they are the rainbow of colors. They're very dark skin and have been. This is not modern. They have been very dark skin all the way to very light skin. Their issue wasn't that she was black. Their issue that she was different. Verse 2, and they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now, just stop right there. Who was Moses' spoke piece, spokesman? Now, I know that Cecil B. DeMille made Moses be the talker. But Moses didn't talk. He stuttered. So God told him, your brother is coming. Let him talk for you. So he's got this high position. If I can use modern terms, he is the assistant pastor and does most of the preaching. Right? So no wonder they said, have not the Lord indeed spoken uh, only by Moses? Only by Moses? Have he not spoken also by us? Now, first of all, that's a little nervy for Miriam to be jumping in the, the game like that, throwing herself along with the party like she's doing some talking too. But you know what happened? The Lord heard it. The Lord heard 
their comments about his man. The Lord heard that they felt like they could, they could, could make it work themselves. Moses wasn't that important. You know why? Because Moses put his robe on one leg at a time just like everybody else. Yeah. I mean, he just took way too much on himself. God uses us too. So when God heard it, verse 3, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And don't understand or misunderstand the word meekness to mean somebody that allow you to walk over them. That's not what the word meekness means. To be meek means to be teachable. He was the most teachable man on the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. Now, do you think that God talking to everybody is a good thing? No. He spoke to Moses. He spoke to the prophets. But look at what he's telling Miriam and Aaron. All three of y'all, come out here. Now, this is not a good thing. Let's, let's just see why. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and he will speak unto him in a dream. Excuse me, and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and the solemnitude of the Lord uh, of the Lord shall be shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? What made you feel like it was okay to say the things that you did? There's a lot of people today doing that very thing. They bad mouthing preachers. Y'all know I'm the first one that will tell you don't listen to everybody preaching. I don't get along with a whole lot of stuff. And I'm not talking about worldly preachers. I'm talking about those baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. A lot of them ain't doing right. But it's not the congregation's place to get them set straight. God has an order for things and how it should be done. You can get your own self in trouble by trying to get the pastor set straight. You see what he says here? I'll speak to the other ministers in dreams and in dark sayings. But my pastor, I'll be very clear with him. You know why? Because who must give an account? The pastor does. How can he give an account if he don't know what's going on? How can he give an account if he don't know what to preach and teach? Now, that doesn't mean that when we get to heaven that the Lord is going to parade each saint that was under that pastor and say, okay, now they was really cutting up. Can you explain why they was cutting up? It's not like that. That's not what he's talking about. What he will do is say, they was cutting up. Why didn't you tell them what I said? You know what preachers are doing today? They are teaching having itching ears. They are preaching what people want to hear. Now, if you are called by God and placed in the position of a pastor and you are preaching what people want to hear, one day you're going to have to explain to God why you didn't preach what I told you to preach, but you preached what they wanted to hear. So, I want you to understand that I'm not saying just go out and obey everybody. Be wise in who you choose to be over you. Because once you choose them to be over you, they are over you. You know, when you put a mailbox up, you go to the, the, um, to the hardware store, 
you buy a mailbox, go outside and dig your hole, get your post, and you cement it into the ground, and you fasten that mailbox on there. The whole time you're doing that, that's your mailbox. The moment you finished, it's not your property no more. It's not your mailbox anymore. If you put that mailbox up, and then you go outside and start beating on it with a baseball bat, that's a federal offense. Legally, and I've done it, legally, if you want to take that mailbox down, you need to tell the postmaster. I need to take that mailbox down and put another one up because it's messed up. Because it's not your property any longer. Once you choose, see, w w before you get a pastor, before you have a pastor, if you leave here and you move to Mississippi, when you get there, nobody's over you yet. Take your time and find a good pastor. Because once you say, I want to be a member of this church, now you are no longer over yourself. Uh, let me be real clear about this. It's a dangerous thing to be over yourself. Amen. Does anybody know why? Because you cannot watch for your own soul. You can't do that. It's in your best interest to hurry up and find a church. Now, I would help you. I'm just using this as an example. I would help you find a church. You don't get to kick up against, I'm going to leave that alone. The anger of the Lord was kindled. We're in verse 9. The anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, oh, now! First it was, doesn't God use me to talk to the people? Now it's, oh Lord. Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Who is he talking to? The Lord or to Moses? How do you know that? Say that again. He said, because God left. That's right. The Lord left. He's talking to Moses. Don't lay this sin against us. Who was affected by this? The whole congregation was affected by this. Let me show you why. Verse 12, let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days. And after that, let her be received in again. And Miriam was shut out of the camp for seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. Now, there's two things that, that we really need to consider. One is the fact that when a person had leprosy, how did they eat? Yes, sir. So you say somebody fed them, and then you say somebody would bring them the food and set it outside the cave, and they would come and get it. Setting it outside the cave is something that they did in, in more modern times, but at this time they're out in the wilderness. If you had leprosy, they just had to leave some food, and when the congregation moved, you got to get the food. But they was not getting near you if you had leprosy. That was a death sentence. Now, I don't know if Miriam fasted for seven days, or if somebody had enough bravery or compassion in their heart to take some food out there and leave it and come running back to the camp and left it for her to get something to eat. The Bible don't tell us that. But what it does say is two things. 
One, that God got up and left because of it. And two, they didn't get to go anywhere until she was off her punishment. You might think that your behavior only affects you, but you are mistaken. When you are saved and you are in the body of Christ and you cut up, you affect everybody's movement in God. Deuteronomy 24 and 9 is very similar to what Jesus said. Yes, ma'am. She said, does that mean like in everything? So if someone backslides, does that affect the whole body of Christ? Absolutely. We are in the streets telling people that this is the best thing that has ever happened. That I was in sin and God brought me out. He did a miracle in my life. Then you walk out and backslide, and you know the first thing somebody will say? Thought y'all had something. You have affected the whole church. You out in the streets cutting up and coming to church pretending like you saved? You think that doesn't affect everybody? You know what I had somebody tell me? I had somebody come up to me and say, does so-and-so and so go to your church? I said, yeah, they do. I mean, they're not a member, but they go there. Well, I thought y'all didn't let people like that in your church. Y'all have a reputation of being good, decent people, but they bad. And I said, that's the reason why they should be coming to church. But do you think that stopped them from, from criticizing the whole church? It sure didn't, because they came enough to where folks associated them with the church. How much more somebody that has the Holy Ghost? And you said, God came down inside of me. But I don't want it no more. That affects everybody. Deuteronomy 24 and 9. Remember what the Lord thy God did unto Miriam, by the way, after that they were come forth out of Egypt. Now you know what this scripture reminds me of? Remember Lot's wife. What happened to her is an example of what God feels about this kind of behavior. Moses, when he was asked by Aaron to have mercy on their sister. Miriam was Moses' sister too. When he was asked by his brother Aaron to have mercy, what did Moses do? No, no, I ain't praying for her. Y'all got yourself into this, get yourself out of it. Is that the attitude he had? No, that is how you can tell a true pastor a true pastor's got the people's heart in his heart. I'm more interested in you being right than me being proven right. I have a problem when pastors are quick to shut down God's people. I've seen it. Quick to just cut them off. He said, what about me? Oh, no, you silenced. You out of here, man. Quick to just cut them off. There's something wrong with that. Moses, how many times did the people threaten to kill him and Moses fell on his face and prayed for them? Many times. They cut up many times. At one point he said, these ten times have you provoked me. And all ten times Moses had to plead for them because God was getting ready to wipe a whole bunch of them out. And Moses pled for them, please don't kill them all. At one point, he, it was like he got into an argument match with God. He said, stand back and I'm going to kill them all. I'll raise seed up under you. And Moses said, don't do that. The Lord said he was going to do it. Moses said, but listen, if you do it, then the Egyptians will say, you had the power to get them out here, but you didn't have the power to save them, so you killed them. He negotiating for the life of the people.
remember, remember what happened to Miriam for bad-mouthing the nationality of, his, of her brother's wife. I'm through with the scriptures. Now let's just get down to the nitty gritty. In this church, we don't need to be joking about color. It ain't funny. Joking only leads to hurt feelings. Somebody's going to get their feelings hurt, and somebody's going to walk away from the church and not want to come back no more. It don't have no place in the church. It has no place in the life of a saint. Leave the jokes in the world. Do you know there are so many other things that you can joke about? It don't have to be about race. We need to knock off the us versus them and generalizations that go along with race. It is not us versus them. When we get saved, we are all one. I thought I could get some more amens than that. We are all one. Once we receive the Holy Ghost, it is no more what they do in the us and what y'all are doing and what we can do to you. It's not like that anymore. Which brings me to the next point. Stop trying to, to resolve the race issues in this country. There have been far greater minds that have attempted it and failed because there ain't but one thing that can fix it and that's the Holy Ghost people have gone so far as to give up their life trying to get freedom you're not gonna fix it leave it alone is this making sense Stop watching and reading things that inflame you about race. What good does it do other than make you mad? I saw a movie one time about Noah. And Noah, when the earth was being flooded, Noah was somewhere in Canaan and picked up Abraham on the ark. That was my thought exactly. She said, huh? You know why? Because that was whoever made the movie. That's the way they wanted to tell the story, that Noah rescued Abraham. Except Abraham was like a 1,000 years later. That was crazy. It was, it was Hollywood. And you can't believe everything they say on TV. You know something you don't see on television? In this country, there were black slave owners down south. You don't see that on TV. You know why? Because that don't sell. Stop listening to all the foolishness that these people are telling you. It ain't got nothing to do with you now anyway. You know where your history is? Right here. And avoid conversations that don't do anything but intensify bad feelings. I, I am not standing here trying to say that we need to walk around and pretend like there's no different shades of color of people. I'm not saying that. I'm saying when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you come under a different set of rules now not just about what goes on in the street. Here, let me say it this way. If you want to sit around and talk about what they're doing to us, God will let you be judged by that. But I'm not. I'm a child of God. I come under a different set of rules. I don't drive down the street terrified that the police might pull me over and shoot me. You know why? Because God's not going to let that happen. You want to be safe? Quit worrying about your color. Start worrying about your soul. 
Leave that stuff alone. Let me tell you something that the press, and this is why it really bothers me. You cannot believe what the news says. None of them. Don't think that the Huffington Post is more accurate than CNN or MSNBC don't tell lies like, like uh, ABC News does. They all craft the story so that they can get viewership. They leave out the parts that are not interesting, even though they may be crucial facts, and add in the things that's going to sell, even though it has nothing to do with the case. Let me give you a quick statistic. In 2016, how many people do you think was murdered in Chicago? Yes, sir. 500. Got 500. Yes, sir. 34 a month. Anybody else? All right. According to, um, according to statistics, 963 black people were killed by police officers. By police officers. Not in Chicago, across the country. 963 in 2016, across the country, was killed by police officers. We should be mad, shouldn't we? We should be really angry. If you're black, you should be mad. 3,550 black people were killed by black people in Chicago last year. Did the news tell you that? 3,550 murders in Chicago. But that don't sell. The, sh the police shooting somebody does sell. So you watch the news and you sit and vegetate on all of that, just sitting there watching it. Can't believe the way they do us. I can't believe uh, Now you mad. And they telling you what they want you to hear. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that there is not injustice going on in this country and in every country in the world. I'm not saying that at all. Amen. I'm not saying that there is not bad race relations in this country and in most countries in the world. I'm not trying to say that we don't have classism in this country and in most countries in the world. I'm not saying that. I'm saying once you get baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, that ain't got nothing to do with you no more because now you are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Leave that stuff back with the old creature. There is no reason why we should be dealing with the things of the old nature that God took away from us. Part of the problem is culture. Different nationalities will sit in their homes and talk about how bad they're treating. Mexicans talk about how bad they get treated. Black folks talk about how bad they get treated. Everybody got somebody that's treating them bad. The Chinese don't like the way they're being treated. It's true. Even white folks, the Irish. Why do you think there's so many Irish policemen in New York? because they were being killed so, so rapidly that they decided to just take over and start becoming policemen to stop them from being killed so much and mistreated so badly. Ain't nobody escaped it. Nobody. And they sit around and talk about it in the home. You may, oh, you see the way they do us? It, it, it doesn't even matter who you are. As soon as you say the way they do us, each nationality got their own group they have designated as the ones that mistreat us. And we just carry that stuff right on over into the church. It's culture. Leave that culture alone. I've heard saints use derogatory terms about different races. It needs to stop. 
I'm not talking about, the, for, for some of y'all who think I'm talking about just the young folks, I'm not. I've heard old folks say ugly stuff. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. Say people don't talk like that. Our goal is not to offend anybody. Oh, well, there wasn't nobody around but just me and my friend. You know what happens when you get comfortable saying stuff? I told somebody this a long time ago. They said, well, when I'm around you and it's just you, I'll call you David. But when we're around the saints, I'll call you pastor or elder. And they kept slipping. I said, you know why? Because it's hard. It is hard to remember where you are. The best thing to do is never do it and you don't have to worry about it. Never play about, relate, about race and you don't have to worry about slipping in front of the wrong person and saying something. Because it really ain't got nothing to do with us no way. Have I beat that, that horse enough? All right. Need to, we need to leave it alone. Now I'm coming all the way back around to where I started. That's the quickest way to get put out of this church. Quickest. I, I'm, I'm telling you, you really want to push my buttons? Start, start clowning and cracking about race. It's been bugging me for a while. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to pull somebody off to the side. And I've been grabbing folks, one here and one there, one somewhere else. And it's like, I'm tired of this. We're going to deal with this right now openly. Everybody needs to know that this church does not tolerate race joking, clowning, playing, segregating, nothing like that. Not here. Amen? Amen. Spread the word. Put it on Facebook. I don't care. People need to know, not here. Amen? All right. Any questions? Really? I must have burnt the wood and sifted the ashes. Yes, ma'am. No, he didn't. No, she said, what happened to Aaron? Didn't he have leprosy too? No. She said, but he was making fun too. Yeah, well, you have to understand their culture. For the female in your family to be shamed like that was a shame to the whole family. That's why in some of the Muslim countries, or yeah, Muslim countries, they will do honor killings. If a girl shames the family, they'll kill her so that the shame leaves the whole family. In their culture, the females were to be very respectable, not like in our country. So for God to put leprosy on Miriam shamed Moses and Aaron. It was. It was a punishment from God that was open for everybody to see. So the reason why Moses, or Aaron didn't get it is because it was more shameful to get her for the whole family than to punish the two of them. Does that make sense? You don't, you don't understand? She said she doesn't understand because she thought everybody should stand on their own. It's just like the woman that was caught in the very act of adultery and where was the man? If she was caught in the act, he was there too. Okay, if you also look at, I just had it. Mm. I lost it that quick. There's another place in the scripture where um, the woman is punished and not the man because of that very thing. It's difficult for us to grasp that type of culture because it is so foreign to what we think and feel. I mean, if you were over in another country and they arrested you, one of the first things you would ask for is a lawyer because that is so ingrained in us. But in some countries, you don't get one. They, they have a whole different system the way they conduct things. And it's foreign, foreign to us. And I've heard Americans say things like, well, that ain't fair. They didn't even let her get a lawyer. And it's like, that's not fair because of the way you was raised. In their culture, 
in their culture, the shame of the woman was greater. Oh, I remember now. Noah. When uh, Ham looked at his father naked, who did he curse? He cursed his grandson. You know why? Because that shamed Ham more than God punishing Ham. It was a shame because it was a blessing for your firstborn to have a blessing. It was a blessing for your father to bless your firstborn. When, Moses, when uh, uh, Joseph had his family come to Egypt, he told his father, lay your hands on my sons and bless them. It was a blessing to have your father bless your children. So what did God do? Cursed Ham's child. Not Ham, his child. And it seemed like, well, Ham, Canaan didn't do anything. Ham did it. But God knew how to deal with them according to how they felt and thought about things. Okay, then I'll punish your child. It doesn't seem fair to us because we don't live like that. But in a roundabout way, we'll do this. I've got three children, and one of them make me mad, and I'm a millionaire. When I die, I leave everything to two of my kids, and one I leave one dollar. Isn't that embarrassing? It means that you were so bad that you got cut out the will on purpose. It's like leaving a penny for a tip. It means I didn't forget. I intended for you to only get one cent. Your service was so bad, I don't want you to think I forgot or I'm one of those kind of people that don't tip. I want you to know I didn't like your service, so I'm leaving you a penny. This is what God is doing. I'm not going to, I won't punish you, but i tell you what I will do. I'll cut your kid off because that's what y'all like. Now, God is fair. He knew Canaan was going to be clowning anyway, so <laughs> he, he, he knew what he was doing. Hey Amen. They cut up in Canaan land. They really did. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> she said, she said, what about on Messenger? It's MS or not MSN, it is Facebook Messenger. And you can change a person's name and give them a nickname. And she started naming off some of them nicknames. <laughs> Let me say this, as long as we're not bringing race into it, I really don't care. If somebody wants to call a, what, what does lavender mean, y'all? Did anybody, a flower? Okay, I need to explain this. So give me a moment, y'all, all right? Brother Delshawn, listen, get, get her attention. Brother Delshawn teases, and he says, people are long bread. That means you got a lot of money. Long bread. You know, when you, give me some bread, that, some money. If you got long bread, it means you got a lot of money. Well, one day, he was calling me long bread, and I said, no, I'm more like short, stubby bread. I don't have a lot of money. Okay, so that's talking about our finances. <laughs> That's, that's young folk stuff. I ain't worried about that. What I am worried about is things that can be offensive and make folks not want to be in this church because they prejudice over there. I don't ever want to hear that somebody's prejudice in this church because I want to be able to say, well, no, they're not even a member of our church. Did y'all catch that? All right because it means you don't go here no more. That's one I might would even seek legal redress and see if uh, we can't even stop you from visiting. I won't have no racism up in here. I'm very, very adamant about that. I like diversity. I like the fact that we can all get along with each other. I like the fact that there's every shade up in here. I like that, and I don't want it to ever turn into anything negative or nasty or divisive. I don't want it to be like that. It needs to remain. We are one family in Christ, 
all in all. All of us. Yes, sir. Oh, amen. Yes, ma'am. Okay, her question is this. If we're visiting another church and we're faced with that, how are we supposed to deal with it? Like saints. We're courteous and gracious, but if somebody wants to bring it up into my face, it's like, uh, we, don't, we don't do that at our church. We, don't, we just don't do that kind of thing. Now, if somebody's trying to set you off to another side, you got your car. I heard about it. She said it recently happened. I heard about it, but I don't even know the details of it. When they started telling me about it, I said, did anybody do anything to one of our members? And they said, well, it was kind of implied. I said, leave it alone. Just don't go there no more. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't need to know the intimate details of what really took place to know if you're being treated funny, leave. Now, God doesn't require us to voluntarily go in and be treated ugly by people. He didn't do that. I, unless you're not being fed here and you need to go somewhere else to eat. You know what I do? When I go into a restaurant, somebody just asked me today about a restaurant here in town that I don't like. They said, well, do, what do you think about them? I said, they charge too much money, don't give enough food, and I don't like the taste of it. You know how often I go in there? Never. <laughs> I don't, I'm not required to go eat in somebody's restaurant. You're not required to go sit in somebody's church. If you're being treated ugly, get up and leave. Go back home. You're being fed here. Find some place to visit that don't treat you ugly. All right? Does that make sense, sister? I don't want to brush over your, your question. But I want you to understand that you don't have to be treated nasty by anybody. Get up and leave. I don't know the particulars of that instance, but I do know that they told me about it. And, and I'm going to tell you, it's silly to think that only Hispanics are prejudiced people. Only white people are prejudiced. Only black people are prejudiced. Only Koreans are prejudiced. I've seen them in all nationalities prejudice. So don't, we don't need to sit back and act like, well, I'll go to a, a Hispanic church because they don't treat people funny. You don't know that. I'll go to a black church because they don't treat folks ugly there. You don't know that neither. The very first time I ever heard of someone being treated ugly because of their race in the church was me and a white brother that went to Benton Harbor. And he said when he got there and sat down, everybody black got up and moved to another pew. I did, I've never even heard of anything like that before. I said, come on, man, for real? He said, look, they all got up and moved. I said, really? He said, yes. I was flabbergasted. I didn't know what to say about that. Never heard of it, never dealt with it. And let's be honest, this is Cassopolis. Ain't nobody here dealing with no racism, and we're walking around with wind in our jaws. You know how they're treating us. You don't, you ain't dealing with none of that. That's, that, that's just what somebody's saying and making you think something. You ain't dealing with it. Hey Amen. I'm trying to be nice. I really am, but I'm getting upset right now thinking about it. Anything else? Stand on your feet.